Hey everyone, thanks for watching this video from Maranatha. We hope that you are encouraged by watching this and our prayer is, is that you would encounter Jesus right where you are today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 1. I want to start out with Luke chapter 1 and then I'll be going to Matthew, or I'm sorry, Mark chapter 2. But before I get there, there's a couple things I want to cover. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for all of the gifts that you gave during Pastor Appreciation. Uh, month there was a a, a, to a good total that came in for to bless all the pastors I don't know uh, I'm looking at the back of Joni's head I don't know exactly how much that was at this time uh, but it was you you have best blessed your pastors in a great fashion and I want to thank you and if you would just go ahead and give yourselves a hand you, you have done a, a great job in that and and let me just thank all of you for all the gifts uh, that you bless with myself or for, uh, bless my wife and myself with for our birthdays. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I talked last week briefly about how in June I taught a sermon prep 101 class, and if you were in that class and you uh, would like to have an opportunity to, to preach from this platform, I ask you to sign up out at the uh, information desk. I'm asking that same thing this morning that if you were in that class, please sign up if you want. Uh, to be a part of that, we'll get together and we'll see how God leads us. Next Sunday, we're going to celebrate uh, Veterans Day. And how many of you were at my birthday party up at the Family Life Center when the quilting ministry presented me with a quilt of valor? Well, there are more veterans that we would like to honor with those quilts of valor. And if you are a veteran, I also ask you to sign up again at our information uh, desk. We would like to honor some of our veterans next Sunday. So if you would please sign up, I would greatly appreciate that. And please press out tonight for First Sunday. The Holy Spirit has dealt with my heart in a different direction for First Sunday tonight. You don't want to miss it. I, I believe that, uh, uh, I, I believe it will be good for, for, for young and um, uh, mature alike. It'd be good for young and mature alike. Everyone come out. Please come out. It, it isn't going to be our, our usual first Sunday the way that we've normally done it, but God's just dealt in my heart, and you don't want to miss it. Tra Joey, they don't want to miss it, do they? Yes, See, Joey said you don't want to miss it, so you can't miss it. You need to be here. Uh, and I would like to, to wish Dennis and Darla Pence a happy 30th wedding anniversary today. Go ahead, man of God, woman of God, stand to your feet so we can honor you. Praise the Lord. That's incredible. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I'll apologize now. I, immediately following this service, I have a worship team meeting down in room six, and I won't be able to be out shaking hands. You don't want me shaking your hand anyway. I got a little bit of a sore throat, and you don't want to catch it. Amen. Are you ready to go? Yes, sir. This morning, I want to talk about go after what's possible. Have you ever just sit and daydreamed with God? Have you ever just sat and just prayed to God and just asked him, God, what's possible? What's possible, God? I'm not asking what's possible with man, but God, I'm asking what's possible with you. And that's the possible I'm preaching about this morning. Go after what's possible, not with man, but with God. And in, in Luke chapter 1, 35 through 38, in this passage of Scripture, the, the angel of the Lord has come to, to the Virgin Mary that is betrothed to Joseph. And, and, and she is getting ready to be married. But before she gets married, the angel of the Lord come and she said, You are the chosen one of God. You are the chosen one to carry his child. And in verse 34, she says, How can this be since I do not know a man? Verse 35, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One in whom will, will, will be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing. Underscore that in your word. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, according to Scripture, if nothing is impossible, then that means everything is possible with God. 
If nothing's impossible, then it means everything, anything is possible with God. Can somebody say amen? Even the impossible is possible with God. But then look what Mary replied. Let it be to me according to your word. Mary had to say yes to what was possible. See, we can pray for what's possible, but unless we go after it, we'll never obtain it. I still believe that God is looking for individuals and churches and teams who will go after what's possible. That will stop sitting back on our do nothing, crying, whining, and complaining, and go after what God has for us. For the past three weeks, this word team has been burning in my spirit. Team, team. And I talked to the staff a couple weeks ago about the word team, and we had a a great staff meeting about it, and I tell you that God's changing some things. There's some changes going on in our staff and and some different direction and so on, but I believe that he is solidifying a team to go after what's possible. It doesn't mean that every person on, on planet Earth will like it, but bless God, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, and we'll go after what God says is possible. Somebody put your hands together and thank the Lord this morning. But to see it, you have to be willing to go after it. You have to say yes to it. You have to hunger for it. You have to hunger for the things of God. You have to have an appetite for the things of God. Teamwork is really about the heart. In fact, I'll go further and say everything in the kingdom revolves around the heart. A heart that belongs to God. In Proverbs 4, 23, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Psalm 24, 3 and 4, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Luke 6, 45, Jesus said, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said again, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Teamwork, serving, giving, forgiving, and thanksgiving all revolves around the heart, not the head. I'm going to go ahead and preach it. You might as well just jump on board. It's about the heart. God wants to do a work in our heart, not our head. I've heard it said many times across the United States that in the church of America today, we have a serving problem, we have an attendance problem, and we have a tithe or a giving problem. And I'm going to be honest with you. I say the church in America does not have a serving problem, an attendance problem, or a giving problem. We have a heart problem in the church of the United States today. I'll go further as to say in the, in the United States of America, in the world, we don't have a crime problem, a drug problem, a race problem, or an unemployment problem. We have a heart problem. That's what happens when you take God out of schools. That's what happens when you remove God from the courthouses in the United States of America. Everybody wants to blame it on guns and crazy people. We've always had guns and we've always had crazy people. But what's missing today is God. That's what's missing today. It's about one heartbeat, and that heartbeat has to be his, not ours. I'm telling you now, you will not hear all that God wants you to hear today unless your heart is open to what God wants to say. There have been many teams throughout Scripture. Moses, Joshua, Aaron, and Hur, Joshua and the Israelite army, David and Jonathan, Naomi and Ruth, Jesus and his apostles, and Paul and Silas. But the one that has struck my heart, that caught my heart, is found in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, but I want to read verses 1 through 5. Now, I'm talking about what's possible as a team. Are you with me? Tell your neighbor he's talking to you and me today. Not just you. See, it's amazing. We get in here, we always want to say, well, that one's for somebody else. But this one's for you today. In Mark 2, 1 through 5, and again he, meaning Jesus, entered Calpurnium after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. 
immediately many uh, uh, gathering together so that there was no longer room to receive them. Not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they saw, so when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, there's much I could preach from verses 1 and 2, but for sake of time, I'm going to write down to verse 3. Verse 3, then they, say the word they. they. That means there was more than one. That means there's a team. A basketball team is not one person. It's five. A football team is not one person. It's 11. It's a team effort, not an individual effort. Verse 3, then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Now get a hold of this. The team is willing to get teammates to Jesus. That a team is able to see something wrong or an issue in a teammate and they are willing to get that issue to Jesus. Many of us, we like being on a team, but we don't like our teammates recognizing our issues. Because many times when teammates recognize our issues, we feel like we're weaker than and less than. And as long as you harbor that, you will be weak. But when you allow your teammates to recognize the issue and get that issue, see, they're trying to get that issue to Jesus, not you. You just happen to be the one where the issue is. I say, if you see an issue in me, carry me into his presence. So we see the team. The team shows up, and the team has a teammate with an issue. <clears throat> I need to pray for my throat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach this message. There's issues in life. How many of you have ever had issues in life? Raise your hand. Listen, how many of you, uh, life hasn't turned out exactly the way that you hoped or thought that it would? Maybe you've had some hurts along the way. Maybe there's been a divorce along the way. Maybe there's been some bruises, some setbacks. Maybe an oops or an oh no has happened somewhere along the way. But listen, it isn't what, it isn't what life does to you that makes the difference. It's what you allow life to do to you that makes the difference. It's about walking through life with those issues, those issues and trials and disappointment and hurts. It's how we allow them to affect us. I don't know everything this paralyzed man went through. I don't know what all he endured in life, but this is what I know at this juncture. He had a team that loved him. He had a team that wanted the best for him. He had a team that was willing to carry him into the presence of Jesus. I don't know what you're dealing with this morning. I don't know where you are, but this day in the house of God, I want you to know you have a team that loves you. You have a team that wants the best for you, and you have a team here this morning that is willing to carry you into the presence of Jesus. Somebody give God a shout this morning. Sometimes, sometimes you have to learn to turn the bitter things of life into sweet. Bitter things, hurtful words, comments, accusations, a loss of a job, a loss of a loved one. You have to learn to turn the bitterness of life. Remember, it isn't what life does to you. It's what we allow life to do to us. That circumstance is not your death sentence, but it can be if you allow it to be. You have authority over. But learn to turn the bitterness of life into sweet. Let me tell you a story. I was talking with a young lady the other day. She had just gotten married. And she got back from her honeymoon. And, and I was at the gym and I saw her. And I said, hey, I said, how was your honeymoon? She said, oh, it was great. 
And I said, well, that's wonderful. How was your wedding? She said, it was good. And, and she began to tell me about the wedding. And, 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 and she, said, uh, uh, she said something about uh, 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 the, a gift that, that, that her grandmother had, had given her. And, and she said her grandmother had come to her and said, what is it that you would like for a wedding gift? And she said, well, Grandma, honestly, she said, we could just use uh, a financial gift to help us pay for the wedding. Well, the grandmother was such of the type that she didn't want to just give a financial gift because she wasn't going to be seen if she just gave a financial gift. She wanted to get a present. She was one that wanted to be seen and known for what she gave and what she did. So instead of giving her granddaughter a financial gift, she bought her $800 worth of cookware with no gift receipt. And the young lady said, I don't even cook. And I could hear, listen to me now, listen, I could hear bitterness beginning to raise up. See, bitterness starts small, y'all. It starts just a little seed. It starts just a little thing, just a little bit of sour, a little bit of bitterness. And then the enemy just comes in and he pours a little bit more and it grows and grows. And I heard that, I said, listen, do you know what you need to do with those brand new frying pans? She said, no, what? I said, you need to go to Krispy Kreme and you need to get you a dozen donuts and let them set overnight. Yeah. <laughs> Billy, you know where I'm going. Savannah, you know where I'm going. And I said, the next morning, cut them in half like a bagel. Uh -huh. Put butter on the flat side and put them down in those new frying pans, flat side down, till they're golden brown and learn to turn the bitter things into the sweet things. <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you, if you just fry some refried donuts, you'll just make sweet. That's what I'm known for in the Harding household when we get to the beach. They like to eat donuts at 10 o'clock at night. No, I'm a 7 a.m. person. I cut them in half like a bagel, butter them. I don't know, maybe that contributed to a little bit of plaque in my arteries, but bless God, <laughs> it's sweet. But learn to turn the bitterness of life into sweet. Can I get an amen this morning? Turning the bitterness into sweet only happens in the presence of Almighty God. God has given us the gift of his presence. Oh. At my birthday party, and again, thank you for all the gifts. And what I'm about to say, don't hold gifts back. I love gifts. <laughs> but do you know the gift that I have reflected most on was your presence? You just being there, eating my sandwiches, and my cupcakes. Hear me now. I'm not being mean. They were mine. I mean, let's face it. We weren't there because you were having a birthday. I had to turn 50 before I got all those sandwiches and cupcakes. And vegetables, of course. Hummus. Woo! Yeah. It's my kind of food, hummus. And I watched you sit and I watched you laugh, and I watched you smile, and I watched you eat those Penn Station subs, and I watched you eat those cupcakes, and it blessed my heart. Because you took time out of your schedule, and you blessed me with your presence. Never underestimate the power of presence because it's the power of presence in life that turns bitterness into sweetness. Can somebody say amen? Listen, listen, it only happens in his presence. This is my team. This is my tribe. This is my family. And you all showed up up there almost standing room only. And just so you know, that wasn't my canoe, by the way. That was Pastor Jay's canoe. It used to be my canoe, but we traded. Everybody thought, oh, look, they got Pastor Canoe. That's not mine. That's his. I got something grander. I had you at my birthday party. And I still remember conversations. I remember faces. That weekend, I did everything I could to take in every second that I could because I know I'm only going to see 50 one time. The next goal is 75. And I expect to see all of you. Come on now, somebody. 
Never underestimate the gift of presence. One of the greatest attributes of God that he's given to his children is for his presence. Not about what he can give us or how he can bless us, but just times him just being there with us. He turns the bitter things of life into sweet things. Listen, in his presence, everything's possible. Somebody shout to the Lord this morning. Then let's move on. The first one, the team is willing to get teammates to Jesus. Number two, if you're going to count them, the team doesn't ask whose job it is. Oh, I'm going, but we're going to have fun getting there. Look at verse 4. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd. Let, let, let me go back up. I, I just I noticed something as I'm reading this. Notice in verse 2 where it said, and they could not even get near the door. That tells me that somebody was expecting these five guys. These five guys hadn't been mentioned yet. But in verse 2, it says, so they couldn't even get near the door. Isn't it amazing to me that when you need to get to Jesus, there is a way that there's always an obstruction between you and your need. But when the need arises, the team doesn't ask whose job it is to get you there. If they're true teammates, they won't look around and say, not my job. In verse 4, look at this, verse 4. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was, so when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was laying. Team doesn't ask whose job, but his team just does it. If someone were to fall out in the aisle this morning and not under the Holy Ghost, but they were dying... No one would have to ask whose job it is to save them. If there is a fire that breaks out over in kids' church this morning, no one would have to ask someone whose job it is to help get the kids out. We would just all make way, make room, and get the kids out, right? Team doesn't ask whose job it is. The team's attitude is I'll be where I'm needed. Are you with me? When they were up on the roof, I I got a a glimpse of this as as I was preparing this message. I'm sure these five guys, they're up on the roof, and the one's laying on the mat, and he's just looking around at all four of them like, okay, what's going on now? And they're all saying, I'm sure, hey, I'm going to go ahead and just stay here, make sure he doesn't roll off the roof. You go ahead and start uh, digging up that roof. And that one said, oh, I don't help. I just sing. So he looks at it, one of the other ones and he said, hey, he said, go ahead. I'm going to keep him from rolling off the roof. And I said, oh, I don't clean. I just teach. Listen, I'm not intimidated today. So he looks at the third one. He said, hey, I'm going to keep this guy from rolling off the roof. Why don't you go ahead and say, oh, I don't greet people when they come in church. I just go in and sit down and enjoy everything. I remember a time, I remember a time some years back here at the church, we had some kind of event going on. I don't know what it was, and the crowd was about like it was today, and all the women decided to use the bathroom at the same time, and they plugged the commodes up in the women's bathroom. Well, I heard about it, and I ran, and I got a plunger, and I'm going down toward the women's bathroom, and somebody stopped me, and they said, oh, wait, you can't do that. You're our pastor. And my words were, I'm well aware of who I am, and right now I'm a commode unstopper. (laughs) Teammates, teammates don't ask whose job it is. They just grab the tools necessary, and they go do what needs to be done. Is somebody with me this morning? There is this thing. There is this thing called responsibility. And responsibility doesn't ask whose job it is when people need to get to Jesus. Nothing irritates me anymore than to see someone at this altar needing to get to Jesus and people standing around. Well, when's it going to be over? Get your hands out of your pocket. Get your mind right. Get down there beside that man or woman and see if you can't pray them through into his presence. Well, it's not my job. It is today. What if that was your son or daughter? I can't yell that high. Man, it's hurting. 
A team is willing to do what needs to be done. They don't ask whose job it is. It was all of their jobs. They accepted the responsibility of every job when they picked him up and said, we'll get you to Jesus. Ah. What I'm trying to tell you is it became your responsibility when you said yes to the salvation of Jesus Christ. It's our responsibility for what to do what's needed. Well, we can't have church. The pastor showed up and didn't show up. I'll guarantee you if I don't show up next Sunday, somebody will be behind this pulpit preaching the word of God. And when they get here, they better be licking their chops, preaching the kingdom of God and the fire of God down. Well, I wish you all would get a little stirred up this morning. There's two things needed about team. Two and one. There must be a willingness to trust. And number two, there must be a willingness to take a risk. Tell your neighbor, trust and take a risk. Some of you can't even get past the first one. Trust? I don't trust. I got trust issues. Now you got more than that. I'm just going to go ahead and preach. And where it steps, it steps. And where it falls, it falls. But if you're going to be a part of a team, you've got to be willing to trust. Number four, verse four. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the one on the bed uh, in the, where the paralytic was laying. Trust. Just lean over to your neighbor and say, do you trust me? Don't answer because half of you would be lying. <laughs> look at your other neighbor and say, do you trust me? I'm not asking you to look behind you. How many were a part of this team? How many were a part of this team? How many hold a hand up? Four or five. The one on the mat didn't do anything. It, what? Oh. The paralytic was part of the team also. The first thing he had to be willing to do was trust the four carrying him. Now on the ground, that's no big deal. I mean, most I'm going to fall is three, maybe three and a half feet. But you carry me on a roof? I don't know about that one, Jack. I mean, these steps, this ladder's a little iffy. And then you're talking about me being on a roof? I don't know. See, team has to be willing to trust. God tells us to trust. Isaiah 26.3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. And then it says, because he trusts in you. You will never have peace in your mind until we trust Almighty God. Listen, I know people have hurt you, but you must trust Jesus. Are you clear? Let me move on to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. And lean not to your own understanding. That means you rationalize and reason too many things in your mind when you should be trusting the Jesus inside of people. You are going to have to learn how to trust people again. I didn't say everyone. But we will never get through life without trusting people. Many times an unwillingness to trust is a cop-out. Listen, I'm going to preach it. Well, I have trust issues. And you use it as an excuse. And many times, an unwillingness to trust is a cop-out because you're not willing to work on that relationship. You're not willing to have those hard conversations. You're not really willing to deal with conflict. So therefore, we just say, we, we just write it off, well, I have trust issues. So it's either we're not willing to work on that relationship or it could be that we're not willing to allow God to deal with the issue inside of us. Oh, so we just write it off, I got trust issues. It's on them. They hurt me. Easy now, Johnny. Easy now, Susie. Easy now, Joey. Easy now, 
Andrea. It may be an issue inside of us, but we're trying to pin it on someone else because we want to use them as, as an escape goat. And God says, no, I want to pin you down and deal with the trust issue inside of you. Why? Because God is trying to put something bigger together than just who you are as an individual. It is not all about how we feel. Well, somebody did me wrong. Well, bless God, get you some refried donuts and move on to the sweetness of life. Wow. Without trust, we'll never accomplish the mission or the vision, or we'll never see the kingdom of God in operation in this house. Statistics say that after seven years of being your senior pastor, you are just now starting to trust me. You've stuck around and I've stuck around. And it tells me you've bought into me and I've bought into you. And I say, bless God, let's go after what's possible and turn this city upside down. Listen, we haven't stayed through the stuff we've stayed through. My God, we haven't walked through the garbage that we walked through for nothing. We paid a price for this. We paid a price to walk where we're walking. And we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of all that God has for us. I haven't sung my best song yet. You can't handle it. I'll, I'll go further and say Jay hasn't sung his best song yet. And I haven't dreamed my greatest dream yet. Just breathe it in, y'all. It'll get to you eventually. I'm telling you, I'm so full this morning. See, I've got big dreams and big visions inside of this old boy. And people have talked about it, and they've talked about me, and said it'll never happen all. Oh, word from God. I say, you just hold on. You just stick around. You just pull up a seat and you watch what God does. It isn't about me and it isn't about you. It's about the kingdom of God being in operation. And if the enemy can give part of the kingdom a black eye, he'll try it. But I say, hold on. The black eye is healing up and that black eye's about to see straight again. God. I don't know. Should I keep going? <laughs> My birthday party that my wife had for me, my son, my oldest son, Kirk, he gave me two pictures. I may have mentioned it to you a couple weeks ago. I don't know. But he said he was somewhere, and he saw him. And for my son, for my son to, to pick out, listen, his wife didn't pick. His wife picks out the best gifts. Most of the time, I want her picking out my gifts. But the past two, last Christmas and this birthday, my son picked out my gifts. He picked, out, he picked me out a Steeler uh, pullover for Christmas last year. I wear it every time I get to My wife's probably tired of seeing it. But my son, my son got me that gift. Man, I'm a mess today. We had that birthday party, and I didn't even look at the gifts until after everyone left. And I went over, and he said, Dad, this is what? what Kaylee and I got you for your birthday, and it was two pictures. And there were aerial views, and one was the aerial view of the metropolis of Enterprise, West Virginia, with all 937 people right there. And then one of them was the city of St. Albans. And I looked at that, something leapt inside my spirit, something stirred my spirit again. 
And the Holy Spirit took me back to a, a little dining room table in a parsonage in Enterprise, West Virginia. And he said, you remember, it was right there at that table. I spoke to you, and I said, I've called you to pastor not hundreds but thousands. You're waiting for all of them to show up in the church. He said, look what I've done with you. I've taken you from this location to this location, and the thousands are all the ones strung up along that river right there. That's You're the pastor of that valley. You're the pastor of that city. I I take nothing away. I take nothing away from any other church or any other. I just know what I'm responsible for. But we'll never see it unless we have trust. And number two, we'll never see it unless we're willing to take a risk. Ask your neighbor, say, you willing to take a risk? (laughs) Say, if you are, go refry some donuts. (laughs) I tell you. You know what I'd like to have for lunch? Yeah. You know what I'm going to have for lunch? Not refried donuts. But I still have some raspberry filling left from my cake. Bless God. Uh, I'm going to close, Joey. Are you closing today? Run up here, son, before I catch another wind to keep going. Got to be willing to take a risk. Listen now, get a hold of this. Now see, it's amazing to me that when we, when we see these pictures of the Bible, when we see these four guys, think about it. Think about the trust he had. I still can't get past trust. Think about the trust they had. It's one thing to carry me up on the roof. But they didn't have synchronization uh, machinery up on the roof. What if one dude got preoccupied by some foxy lady walking, oh, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, forget that. Erase that. What if somebody caught the whiff of the Krispy Kreme? Womp, womp. Refried donuts tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, Jay, I, you know, I said I trust you with my life. And that's easy for me to say as long as you're not carrying me on a mat and letting me down through a little hole in the roof. But my son, that son that got me those pictures... I heard somebody ask him one time, do you trust anybody enough to, for this to happen? He said, I trust one enough, my dad. I'm like, you got that right, buddy. That's right. You can count on me. As long as I got breath in my lungs and my heart's beating, yeah, you can count on me. A team has to be willing to trust and have to be willing to take a risk. We paint these pictures of Bible stories and we think everything's just lovey-dovey. It's perfect. Nothing could ever go wrong there. But can I tell you, they did not have a guarantee as to how Jesus would respond to them once he got in front of him. had no guarantee but they were willing to take a risk go after what's possible you never know what's possible until you get into his presence you never truly know what's possible until you get into his presence go after God chase him down run after him what's possible always involves a risk How many of you watched that WVU game last night? I'm thinking, see, they played that game just so I could preach it this morning. It's all set up. I'm sitting there, I'm sitting in the living room. We'd just been out with Danny and Karen Spradlin. and we went out to, to dinner and we got back and and we're sitting there talking, and I'm asking my phone, hey, Siri, what's the score of the WVU football game? And my wife says, why don't you just turn it on? Well, I didn't want to be rude. I guess I was already being rude, but I was kind of wanting to know. And Danny's over there. He's kind of wringing his hands here. I didn't realize he wanted to watch the game, too. So we turn it on, and there was no defense hardly at all in the game until they stopped West Virginia in the fourth quarter. I'm thinking, great. 
of all the times to miss a fourth down. Now you got to do it now. So then anyway, they scored, and then West Virginia goes down. 16 seconds left in the game, they scored. And I'm thinking, oh, man. I said, Danny, what do you think, Dano? I said, you go for one in the tire, you go for two. And we're debating back and forth. Do you play it safe and go for the tie, go into the overtime? I don't know about West Virginia's record. I don't know, man. You probably just better, I don't know. Maybe we should just try it. I don't know, Danny. So they decided to go for two. 16 seconds left in the game. And they run a little looking pass. Greer hits the, the little tight end right there. Woo! Here, the stinking coach for Texas called timeout for the random play. I said, great, can you believe that? That was the only hope of two-point conversion. What's the chances of getting two two-point conversions? I mean, it's over now. Might as well forget just to go for one now. Oh, no. No, not Holderson. His hair in the only is a mess. <laughs> Hope he's watching. Hope he's down here next week. Yeah. He called a different play. It's getting smoky in here. This thing, is it smoky? Those things still all okay. One day the Holy Ghost is going. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, they ran another play, and I'm thinking, hey, there's no. It, it, they're not going to win. They're not going to make it. And then when Greer drops back, looks, and everybody's covered, I'm like, forget it. He takes off around the I said, they're going to do it. Hey, Dano, he's going to get in. He's going to get in. He ran right in. Yeah. Then they flagged him for throwing the football. If you're going to win a game, you got to learn how to take a risk. And I'm going to tell you something. You hear me. I don't like to fail. I do not like to fail. But if I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail at taking a risk, not sitting back playing it safe, twiddling my thumbs around. And when you take a risk, you're not always the most popular person in a positive way, bless God. I don't like to lose. Listen, I don't like to fail, but one thing I hate more than failing, that's losing. And I'm not going to sit back, play it safe. I'm going after the win. How about you? I'm going after what God had. Listen, we get, a, get a hold of this. I, I said I was closing, right? Are you finished yet? I can just close it now. You want me to just say amen? Listen, the Baptists are already there because they're an hour ahead today. I mean, they, everybody's running around early, okay? Half of them skipped church and they just went straight to dinner. So I'm doing you a favor, okay? Because they're not Maranatha. But anyhow, I'm just full. I didn't get a preach last Sunday. You all handle it? That was lame. Get a hold of this. Trust and risk released hope. Trust and risk released hope. Can you imagine that paralytic laying down there looking up into the eyes of Jesus? Can you imagine the hope that welled up inside of him knowing I'm in the presence of healing right now. I'm in the presence of deliverance. Whether he speaks to me, whether he looks at me, I'm in the presence. In his presence, that's when everything's possible. Imagine the hope that welled up on the inside of him. What is your motivating factor? Is it fear or is it hope? Fear can motivate a lot of things. But the end is anxiety and pressure. But hope, when hope is the motivation, there's peace and there's rest. Because all fear, perfect love casts out all fear. I saw this hope last week in an inmate at Mount Olive Correctional Center. I hope you all have. I'm just going, I'll, I'll try to be brief, I promise. A couple weeks ago, Calvin Suffin that comes here, he's started a ministry in, in, the, 
in the prisons in, uh, around the state of West Virginia, but he has got Appalachian Bible College to come in to Mount Olive Correctional Center and te teach these guys to where they can get a four-year degree in Bible. And it's phenomenal about what's going on. And Calvin came to me and said, Pastor, he said, our first class is getting ready to graduate. And he said, what we would like to do on this first graduating class is that we would like to start a church inside of Mount Olive Correctional Center. And we would like for Maranatha Fellowship to plant that church inside of this correctional. It'll be the first church ever in the state of, in the history of West Virginia inside a correctional facility. <laughs> And he, and he met with Pastor Jay and I, and he said, you can say no at any time. I said, I have a choice, but yet I don't have a choice. Am I about, am I about loving people? Am I about building strong families? Am I about city transformation or not? Is it just words on the wall, or is it really in my heart? And he said, Pastor, what I'd like for you to do, I'd like for you to come to Mount Olive, and you, we would like for you to meet the man that we have selected to possibly be the first pastor of this church. But all you have to do is say, he's not the one, and we'll look for someone else. I think it was last Thursday or Thursday before, I don't remember, I went up and I met this man. How many of you saw, have seen the statue up in Charleston where the two police officers were killed? How many of you have ever seen Raise your hand. This man is the one who killed those two police officers. And he has sent, since met with many first-year uh, 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 police academy students and talked to them and poured his heart out about how, uh, how wrong he was and how he was caught up in all kind of stuff and how he hated people couldn't stand it. And I sit across the table from him and he said, Pastor, he said, back, I, he, he'll be 60 years old in November. And, and he sit across from that table from me and he said, I think it was back in 2004. He said, I found Jesus. Or maybe he said, I should say, he found me. He found me in the depths of my sin. He found me in the depths of my darkness. He came to this prison and he found me. And he picked me up and he breathed new life into me. He forgave me of all my sins. And I said, God, if this is really you, if you really want me to live for you, you're going to have to send people my way to help me because I can't do it myself. It wasn't long after that, God began to bring this one in, began to bring that one in. And a couple years later, he began to bring Calvin Suffin in with Malachi Dads and all this stuff. He will never see life outside of prison according to the correctional facilities. But he said, I can help transform people inside these walls. And he said, this is a day that I long awaited. He said, they told me that one day I might be a pastor of a church inside of a prison, but I didn't think it would ever happen. He said, but today I have hope. Today I saw hope in his eyes. And I saw that motivation shift. It's no longer fear, but it's now hope. And this is the vision. These guys who will never see, who, who will never see a life outside of prison, who's been in this Appalachian Bible College, they've already been thinking their vision is that, okay, I'll never get out of prison, but I can help transform people who will get out of prison. And he's going to pastor the church there, and then they have hopes of taking some of those people and trans, and, and, and trans uh, 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 getting them to a different prison to where they become missionaries in different prisons. And they said, we want you to start another campus in this prison and another campus in this prison once we get our missionaries out there. That is vision, but that's hope. 90%, 90% of all inmates have a release date. What would happen if God could get a hold of it? Oh, I, I remember. I, I know I'm, I don't care. I, I remember a few weeks ago I was preaching and the Holy Spirit hit me and a prophetic word come forth. And I said, the next great move, the next great wave of the great awakening will come through the prison systems of the state of West Virginia. I had no idea at the time anything about this. And I looked back on that I thought, God, what in the world was I saying? Must have been those refried donuts that I missed out on. I don't know, God. And then two weeks later, this was brought to me. And that vision laid out, listen to me, y'all. When was the last time that we've put ourselves in a place for God to move? 
When was the last time that we lowered ourselves down into his presence and we took a risk, not knowing how he's going to respond? But I'm going after what's possible. I want to see demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. And I'll lower myself down into his presence, but I'd rather you go with me. Go after what's possible right now. Don't think about it. Just act upon it. Just take a risk. Put yourself in front of Jesus. Okay, you don't know how he's going to respond. But I'm going after what's possible. It starts in your heart. A hunger for a change. A hunger for life. A hunger to let go of a life of darkness and sin. And a hunger to grab hold of a a life that is full of peace and joy and Holy Ghost. What's possible in your family? What's possible in your marriage? What's possible in your body if you just lower yourself down into His presence? What's possible in your business or in your ministry? This morning as you stand to your feet, I'm going to ask anyone who is ready and willing to go after what's possible together around this altar and just cry out to God. If your heart needs saved, then come to Him and cry out for salvation. If your marriage needs healed, your body needs healed, then just come and ask Him for it. If you just need to turn around, or if you desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit, just come and surrender and say, God, I want everything that you have. Is there anybody hungry for what's possible? Is there anyone in the house who's willing? I'm not trying to make it a competition, but I am trying to challenge you. Ask God to heal your marriage. Ask Him to move in your business. You ask Him to move. And you come expect and let hope well up on the inside of you. Go ahead. Hey, thanks for watching. We hope that you enjoyed this message. Real quick, there's three things that we want you to do. First, we just want to encourage you. Share this video with someone who might need it or comment below. We'd love to see how these videos are impacting people. Second, if you feel led, click the Give button below to support the ministry so that we can continue to love people, build strong families, and transform cities all over the world. And last, if there's anything that stuck out to you from this message that you would like to share, or if you need prayer, email us at prayforme at mfctoday.org. Thanks again for watching.